yeah, my son Parker, he joined soccer at 10 and they were like, well, he should have been out here eight years ago. Did I miss when I should have gotten them involved? Did I need to start him that early? Is he going to miss out or not be able to get on the team? You're going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on your child that will mess them up. That's why a 40 year old man will be yelling at a five year old out on the field is because they're not secure. If your identity is based on what you do, what happens when you can't do it? On this episode of Live Change Podcast, we're going to be entering into the intense world of youth athletics. And to do that, we're going to be talking to Brian Brown. Brian Brown is a leadership and high performance coach. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Welcome to the Live Change Podcast, Brian Brown. Hey, it's good to be with you guys. Looking forward to today's conversation. So, Brian, can you tell me a little bit about yourself for those that, you know, maybe don't know you? Uh, Absolutely. I am the founder and president of the 127 Group, which is based off of Psalm 127, that if the Lord, unless the Lord builds uh, the house, the builders labor in vain. And so part of what we do is we assist in building leaders and organizations. My current clients are Florida State, uh, Baylor, Southern Methodist University, TCU. Um, I'm the father of two boys who played Division I sports. And so I'm a, I'm a sports fan. I've played sports my, you know, most of my life. I'm now 60. And so uh, now I enjoy it more than play it. So that's kind <laughs> of a, a, a synopsis of who I am. That's awesome. You know, we have kids who do sports, and I feel like Chad and I are just trying to figure it out okay, this and is... not ruin it along the way. <laughs> Brian, uh, let, let's just get real a second. These questions and this conversation is is really just for Joanna and I. Oh, my goodness. And everyone else can just <laughs> listen in. <laughs> I feel like sports registration like just opened or some of them are about to open, and it was just like, okay, now what? Are we doing this again? Are we doing it good? So, so anyway. And and to start out, Brian, like, okay, so we're going to talk about all the questions that we have about the pressures that are on young athletes, what our role as parents should be. But before you get into that, talk about, you, you like sports. Like, so we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls, but but talk about the fact that sports are actually a good thing for kids, you know, and, you know, we're not going to bash sports here today. So tell us, what are some of the good things that come out of sports? So yeah, I'm a huge fan of sports. And the reason being is that there are things in life that you go through that are great teachers. And uh, sports sports are an incredible teacher. And so when I'm working with athletes, part of my role with any of the programs I work with, and I'm not one of those guys that just comes in and gives one speech. Most of my uh, sports clients I've had uh, the longest team I've had has been over 10 years and I'm with them throughout the entire season. Mm. And so, uh, that's, I get embedded into the team. Uh, but we're, what we're trying to do all the time is use the game to prepare you for life, not let the game use you. So I think for one of the first questions, Joanne and I kind of agreed upon here today is this, this pressure that we as parents feel. So, uh, I think there's a lot of parents like that, us that struggle because we want our children to reach this this full potential this you know what i don't even know what the goal is but we just know it's full potential and that includes athletically and so there's this balance between wanting our kids to reach their this mythical full potential but also not being too hard on them putting too much pressure on them putting too many expectations on them so uh, what's at stake if we get this wrong? And, and can you unpack a little bit of this like kind of tightrope that these parents are walking? Yeah, and I would even say with that, the tension of did I miss when I should have gotten them involved? Oh, thank you for asking so, that. So like even the thing about like June starting tennis at three or like Finn starting baseball at seven, it's like, well, did I need to start him that early? Because like the feeling of like, well, is he going to miss out or not be able to get on the team if we like prolong him joining sports yeah my son parker he joined soccer at 10 and they were like well you could sign up for the seniors level because you know he should have been out here eight years ago yeah the very first thing uh, is understanding that we as parents are the greatest influence on our children's lives it is caught more than it is taught And so everything we do as parents either reinforces a child's confidence or in some way discredits their self-esteem and they're going to carry that 
they're going to carry either of them for the rest of their life. And uh, so probably the first thing that maybe we ought to talk about is how do we make sure that their identity is solid? Because identity is basically, it's a fact of being who or what a person is. And the thing that most people do in our culture is they form identity about themselves based upon what they do and their behaviors. So what happens if, if your identity is based on what you do, what happens when you can't do it? Then you leave, that leads to confusion and that leads to uncertainty. And then that's going to lead to the insecurity and anxiety about yourself. And man, if you have that kind of anxiety, which I, I'm telling you, I deal with, I can walk into a gym or an athletic training room full of athletes and I can ask D1 athletes, how many of you struggle with performance anxiety? And I, I, every time, about 95% of their hands wow. go up. Wow. And, and that leads to psychological issues. That leads to burnout. That just, that's not freedom. And so you ask about when. Uh, when should we get kids involved? I, I think there's a couple things. Uh, one, you better make sure that you as an adult is in a healthy place and you understand where your identity and security comes from, because if not, you're going to try to get it through your kid and then you're going to mess them up. So good. And, and so I think, you know, it's also making sure that like, okay, man, I have instilled some really good beliefs and values into my son or daughter so that they're strong enough when they get into that temptation out there on the field that wants to pull them and say, your identity comes from what you do, not who you are. Mm. Yeah, wow. that's so good. Oh, my word. That I, I love that you said here. that. Yeah, that was... <laughs> Yeah, ch check yourself. Like basically telling, I didn't expect you to go there. I thought, you know, you would talk about the, you know, don't put pressure on them. But it's starting with where the pressure comes from is why am I yelling? Why am I pushing? What is the purpose of it? And and doing an yeah. honest discussion and honest, you know, kind of dissection of your own heart. That's whew. In our culture, people talk about FOPO a lot is a, is a great restrictor of high performance. And I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase or not, but no. what FOPO is, is fear of other people's opinion. Oh. And, and that is, you think as a parent, if your identity isn't secure, then when your kid walks out on that field, then that's an extension of you and how they perform, then you have that fear that that's how I'm going to be perceived by other people. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, I see that in youth sports all the time. That's why a 40 year old man will be yelling at a five year old out on the field is because they're not secure. Yeah. And they're worried about what other people think of them instead of investing in these kids to, to help them use the game to prepare them for life. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, I think we got to remember to, um, we're not raising 12 year old baseball players. We're raising 34 year old husbands, fathers yeah. and, and uh, professionals, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so it's like, what maybe gets you a little bit better baseball at 12 is it making them a better adult someday mm -hmm. and, and asking those kind of questions. Brian, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I deal with, I deal with a coach of the year taking his team to the final four, but he is always more concerned about how he is developing his athlete athletes to be a blessing mm. in later in life. And how am I developing you one to be a follower of Christ to be a leader in your family, in your community, in your vocation, uh, his outcome he knows isn't what happens on that court this year, it's what happens 20, 30 years from now. Um, and, and they, and they revert back to, this is how the game shaped them. Yeah. But you, you think about how many, uh, you know, I, I'm a guy, so I can pick on guys, but how many 40 year old men are getting their identity 
because their little league team won 10 games this year and they're better than Joe who won eight. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait, did you forget this was about the kid and not about you? It's called little league, not right. adult league. Yeah. Wow. So Brian, what I'd like to do is, uh, Joanne and I are going to go back and forth kind of telling you some beliefs that parents have, we've heard parents say, and I want you to kind of tell me, is it truth? Is it, is it fact or is it fiction and myth? Uh, so first belief, uh, I've, I've heard this myself. I want my child to play sports through school because it will lead to them playing in college. Uh, is, is that, that belief, you know, how factual is that? Okay, well, let's talk about, first of all, um, let's talk about at the elite level in college, which would be Division I athletics. Yeah, and that's what you a lot of parents are kind of wanting. If you're a high school athlete, your odds of playing Division I athletics is around 2% off of your varsity team. Wait. So you think about that. All You have to first make it to the varsity level, and then only 2% actually get uh, to play D1. Mm. If you're if you're not playing just college sports in general, it's it's about five to seven percent uh, that you have the ability to either play D one, D two, D three, NAIA, or junior college. Wow. Both of my boys, uh, they're American teens. You got to remember that some sports are international sports. So in college, tennis is about. 65 percent inter 65 to 70 percent international students so much my, my boys chances were less than one percent that they would play uh division one athletics so you better know that going in otherwise you're going to have stress is unmet expectations and if you believe that you're you just because they're playing high school sports means they're going to play college you're Man, you're going to have a lot of stress in your life. And I think we're selling promises to our kids because I've done this, you know, because and I knew nothing before meeting you, Brian. I was like, <laughs> I don't know. You might go pro. I don't know. You, you just learn soccer. But, you know, and I, I think we have this but these beliefs that we have. But the cold, hard reality maybe changes the priority that we put on some of these sports in their lives because they are 100 percent going to be an adult. But they yes. are three yes. percent <laughs> going to be in college sports, and like less than that D one. So, hmm. Yeah, and the odds of the odds of you really making a top twenty program are roughly a thousand to one oh. uh, across sports and things. And so, okay, you know. And the other thing is, is that I didn't play. I was on a club sport. I played volleyball in college at Texas A&M. It was a club sport, but we were really, really good. And I don't know if you know this, but there are 2 million student athletes compete in club sports every year. Now I played a club sport at uh, 19, I'll tell you my age, 1985 is what my first year on the club team at A&M. I played until 1995 was my last year in uh, US Open uh, volleyball, but I got to play until I was 32 years old and wow. that's what shaped me. And so, but that was never, we were non-scholarship athletes, but the opportunity, and then you probably take intramural sports, which is, you know, even higher than that. So it, it, you know, the game's a great teacher. You can be involved. It's just at what level you want to be at. Wow. That, okay. That, that alone that's was great. worth the, the price of admission. So I think another belief that's easy to fall into kind of the trap of is playing sports now as a financial investment into their future education and it'll pay off when they get a scholarship to college. So what does that look like? Okay, first off, has anybody uh, really looked at the market and realized how expensive college is? Um, I, what are you trying to do to me, Brian? <laughs> yeah. Like it's getting real depresso here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, so I don't know if you've ever heard of what's called COA. It's cost of attendance, and it's what universities put out. They they will uh, publicize their COA, their total cost for a school year, meaning their fall and spring semester. And because, like you said, I was in Pennsylvania in October speaking with that school district. Out at the top, I think fifteen or twenty colleges in Pennsylvania. The average cost of attendance for the year is, you want to guess? I, oh. I don't want to guess. 
This is the worst game of trivia ever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I put you on the spot. Uh, it, it it works out to about ninety four thousand a year. Uh, so now I have to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they, yeah, that's that's four hundred thousand dollars for a four year degree. Yeah. Because so you're tell paying me for now, the college Should my three year old start tennis? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So let's let's take that. So both of my boys play tennis. Uh, I'm, I'm the parent of a junior tennis player. Let's say that I, I live in the great state of Pennsylvania. I want them to play D1 at a program close to home. So looking at the programs in Pennsylvania, I look, let's take Bucknell, for example. Great school. Well, the cost of attendance is $80,000 to go there for a year. The tennis is what's called an equivalency sport. And you need to understand that as a parent, there are headcount sports because you think, oh, well, they're going to get a scholarship. Well, a headcount means that they get, they get their cost of tuition and things. Equivalency means they only get a partial because a thing like uh, men's tennis, you have 10 to 12 players on the team, but you only have four and a half scholarships. Mm. So the average cost of uh, average uh, scholarship is seventeen thousand dollars. Wow. Well, your cost of attendance is eighty, so oh. it doesn't equate, and so you still have to come up with that money to even if you get the scholarship, uh, it, it just it doesn't work out. So you have to make that decision, but you're going to it's going to cost you. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's one of those things that club sports, uh, club sports, you've got whatever they're going to charge you, which is probably around four or 5,000 a year to get really good coaching. As a parent, you're going to spend about six plus hours a week in travel, driving back and forth to practice. You're going to need to take them to tournaments. You're going to have private lessons and fitness. You're going to have injuries and homeschooling wow. and everything else. And you're going to have to weigh, should I put that money in the bank and just let it gain interest? Should I go play Powerball, which your odds are better? Or, <laughs> or you, you need to understand your why. Um, and that was a lot to take in, but that was, and you just need, you need to know, you need to have somebody give you good counsel. Uh, because you'll wake up and you'll not realize, man, I wasted a lot of energy and effort and it didn't meet my expectations. So you're saying that out of all of these athletes that are in the U.S., only one to three percent are going to play college. And out of that, a fraction of that is going to get a scholarship. And out of those scholarships, most of them are not full rides. Right. So yeah. you're, you are talking a little bit, get, you're getting close to Powerball odds here of, of getting kind of a full ride scholarship. And I imagine you also have to play at that level uh, or you lose your scholarship, you know, or academically or every. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about academics because you, you, if you don't understand, you're a student athlete. And the programs I work with are they're trying to keep their GPA up. And so you're spending, you have two full-time jobs in college. And so if you think, oh, okay, we're going to devote this all to athletics and you're not a good student, you will not uh, retain your scholarship, even if you get one. Um, and you're going to be a problem for the coach and it's going to be frustration. That I think that the most important question you have to answer as a parent is why? Why? Do Because I'm okay investing that much if it shapes my child in a positive way and they become a better leader out of it. Mm -hmm. If you're investing it just to get a scholarship, then there are other ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah, like a high-yield savings account might be better to save Absolutely. up for college than... Trying to trying to do it through through sports yeah. um, or academically, right? Uh, you know, there'll be an academic side, which there's a lot more scholarships available. I think probably on that side. I can't. I'm not an expert on that, uh, but yeah, there's there's so many different ways uh, to fund it. But if that's your intent, 
man, you're going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on your child that will mess them up. And you got to remember, they're kids. Yeah. They're kids. Yeah. You know, the game should be fun. And it's just that's that's some of that tension that you're going to feel. That's so good. And like what I also so even just hearing that, what I'm probably processing even in my current life stage is like we are a part of a rec team. And like I love our like ragtag group of kids that's like we're just very much learning the game, having fun doing it. Um, and so it's funny hearing you say, hey, to put more pressure on your kid to potentially meet an outcome that they might not even meet. I don't know. I'm just sitting here thinking like, great, then I'm going to stay with my fr like my fun wreck bubble. <laughs> because yeah. like, I think you do feel that in other circles that then you find yourself in that it's like, oh, like yeah. your kids aren't doing that clinic or like, oh, your kids aren't trying to make that travel team. And it's like, no, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily feel like it aligns kind of like with our family. Why or like yeah. vision for this season. And it is really easy to feel like, oh my goodness, are, is, are we wrong? Yeah. And so anyway, you're very much validating probably some of my <laughs> thoughts and feelings and what we're processing. Well, I had this conversation yesterday with a friend who I said, hey, I'm doing this podcast tomorrow. And he's like, and he told me a story of his nephew who his nephew grew up and only played little, little league baseball during the summers. Never played, never went to clinics, never did uh, travel ball, never did anything got a full ride baseball scholarship to Mississippi state, <laughs> got drafted and is playing in the pros. And he made the statement pros will always find talent, mm. uh, but we bought into the myth like, Oh, we got to get our kids in this showcase and over here yeah. and over there. Um, if you're talented, man, they'll find you, but you talk about, you know, it's interesting. You said, I love my rec league ragtag group. And your kids are learning how to do teamwork, how to move as a unit towards a goal, which most, most of us get put in places of employment that are kind of ragtag people, right? Yep. And we have to learn to work together towards a goal yeah. where if you're on a select team, it's all about the individual and how good I am because I got to get a scholarship. And then what happens is when the people around you aren't performing, then you get critical of them. And it, it, it just breeds into that individualism so many times. I'm not saying there's other times that, man, you just see them take off, but it, it just, you really need to know what you're doing. Yeah. And, and that's sometimes where, I get paid to come into the, these, these college programs that I'll go, I'll ask the coach, what's your vision for the program? And they'll go, well, it's this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay, well, what's the vision of your university? And they're like, I don't know. Well, I'm like, okay, well, the university pays you. <laughs> your goal should be the same as their mission and vision. Why are you separate? Uh, yeah. is it, I think we've lost focus of that in our in our uh, in college athletics that there's a purpose behind why you go to college i think college in general has lost focus of that but that's a whole nother podcast yeah and it's funny because even like the early church was also a ragtag group of people <laughs> so it is like just kind of funny to think about i don't know even when you think about the disciples and putting 12 of them together and say jesus saying hey go move the mission together like yeah, this was not the pros right yeah the um yeah and and yeah. along those lines, Brian is like you know you have you have the same parents that you know same kind of beliefs that you know well, my kid's gonna go pro. Uh, you also have the <laughs> the parents that are bringing in, and so like we know that the okay if it's that astronomical to play D one college, uh, just you can say it in a couple sentences here. What what the gods of going pro? What's that? What's that? Uh, yeah, the odds of, of going pro where you are, actually get paid millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and you don't, uh, you know, you you do know that NFL stands for not for long, and <laughs> and, and so you're only and, and you only have about a two. I think on average, the NFL player has a two year career. So even if you make it to the pros, that's not your life journey. So the odds of playing, it, you know, it's less than it's it's like half a percent that you're going to play professionally. Uh, baseball, 
has the highest odds, and that's about half percent. All the other professional leagues are 0.0002% that you're going to play pro. Now, if you're a parent and you say, oh, but my kid's different. Let me just tell you, I was on a plane to the Dominican Republic uh, this summer, and the guy sitting next to me was with from the Cardinals. I watched as five other guys got on that I know were wearing professional baseball gear, meaning they were professional scouts, and they get it right about 50% of the time. And they're professionals at this. The NFL hires about 320 full-time scouts and they get it wrong all the time. So what makes you think as a parent that like, oh, well, no, I'm smarter than they are. And it's like, yeah, I, I, no. I'm able to see talent better than they are. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if you're able to spot talent better than they are, then man, I'll hire you to help <laughs> companies find talent. <laughs> you know? That's an offer right there. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> So actually what you're saying is maybe my son has a better chance of becoming a talent scout than actually playing. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. You'll have a much longer career, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, what is that whole toughen up thing? Like you you got to, you know, raw, you know, the, the hoorah yeah. that parents are, are pushing their kids is like, you know, it's hard, but, you know, that's grit and determination and every Under Armour and every Nike ad. And it's like, you know, like push and push and push and. Uh, what do you is, is is have we is there a myth behind that's actually what brings about yeah, good results? This is one that I mean, like one resiliency is a key. Uh, it, it's a key in the boardroom. It's a key in the cancer ward. It's the key in life. Being able to bounce back. Now, I will tell you that. Uh, on average, the average child spends less than three years playing a sport. That's the average. Mm. So wow. like you go three years and you're going to invest, you're going to push, push, push for something that there are most of them across most sports, they quit by the age of 11 because it isn't fun anymore. Mm. So if you're going to leverage all those things that sport teaches, and you start to push them too much to where it doesn't, the game isn't fun, yeah. then you're gonna miss out on all those benefits. And so it, it's finding that right ratio and balance and and that requires some some trial and error, uh, trial and error just based on your child. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's, someone like me can't tell you, yeah, this is what you do because I don't know your child. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I don't know what you already, what you value, uh, what all those things that come into play. Um, your child is unique and you ought to be the best student of your child and know like, okay, what, what actually, what drives them and, and how do I help them see the fun? How do I help them see the benefit? Yeah. Uh, they're going to have to put in the effort. It's not, it's not just handed to them. All those things, yeah. And I will, I will tell you the the greatest myth that I have dealing with a college athlete is they're getting stronger in their training. When we're having to go, no growth happens in the recovery. Mm -hmm. It uh, uh, it happens when you get in the ice bath. It's when you happen when in your sleep you tore down the muscle in the training. It rebuilds in the recovery. And you think if you apply that to your kid in sports, yeah, that competition was training, but you got to give them a chance to recover. And That's be a awesome. kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, like a season yeah. without a sport, you know? It's like soccer yeah. every season, but but not this one. You know, this one you're just gonna just gonna kick, you know, a ball on the backyard. You're just gonna be a kid. So And um, I, I'm I'm curious too, like you touched on this a couple of times from even the young adult athlete lens. And we have a pretty broad audience here on our podcast. Like what's something you'd actually say to a young adult who is experiencing, whether it's the time in the recovery yeah. or the, hey, college is over, I'm no longer playing and I have misplaced identity now. Like what would you say to those young adults? Yeah, I think first of all that, man, your creator created you for a unique purpose. And when you find that 
that gifting and you see a need in the world that you can meet, that's when you're going to thrive. Mm. Um, sports help you kind of hone sports, hopefully brought some self-awareness to you to what are my giftings and how do I work with people and how do I, God's the giver of all good gifts. I'm, I'm asked now to steward those gifts and how do I take those gifts to a multiple? How do I use those gifts for character is if I, if I don't have good character, I use those gifts selfishly for me. If I have good character, then I use those gifts to help others. And that's where you're going to really look, I get it. I I'm a former athlete. Um, I, I want to get out there and play the game, I, but I'm 60 years old. Yeah. But I use those experiences now to come alongside of younger athletes and go, hey, man, there is life and life abundantly out there. You just need to make sure you know which road you're walking to find it. Yeah, that's awesome. And I am curious, just one other audience. I know I can only imagine we have some coaches that are listening to this episode as well. And so if you were even under some of the content we've been talking about, like, what would you say to a coach listening to this, especially if they'd say, hey, yeah, I am a life changed by Christ. Like, how does that affect how they coach? Most of the coaches, they, they want to make a difference. And they are the difference makers in our culture in so many ways these days. And so I would tell you, first of all, man, you are a person of value if you're a coach and you're going to make a difference either negatively or positively, you choose. And I hope that if you're listening to this podcast and you're a coach, then man, do everything you can. Your training is to get in and learn the ways of the kingdom that bring life to people. I, I tell people all the time, I teach leadership across the globe and I tell people, I don't have to be that smart. I just have to know the Bible really well because if you follow God's ways, then they bring life and life abundantly. But if you go opposite of that, if they bring destruction. You choose. You choose which path. There's only two paths. Yeah, and so awesome. even in leadership, everything I teach leaders is like, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way. Walk in it. Thanks for sharing that. That's so good. The um Man, I'm just taking a lot of notes for myself because I, I also coach a rec uh, soccer team. So I'm just thinking about the, the guys I coach. This is good stuff. Um, yeah, I would tell you, uh, you know, the greatest thing I learned coaching Little League is that every kid had a treasure inside of them. My job as a coach was to unlock it. So every I learned this when... Um, when my oldest was probably 11 or 12 year old and I was coaching a, a little league team that was really, really good. And every day after practice, we had gather at the mound, but I made sure that there were some kids that they just weren't blessed with great athleticism, but they were great in the classroom. And so I would ask their parents, Hey, what, what was something that you're proud of, uh, of him this week? And so we would celebrate that on the mound. And so I would I would challenge you to find like make sure that every one of those kids get celebrated that they uh, that there is value in them and find a way as a coach do the hard work do the hard work to find out what that is. Would you recommend if you're a parent with an exceptional exceptionally talented child, um, guarding them a little bit, maybe, you know, shielding them a little bit from this, this praise from, from others and adults. Cause. Uh, well, I think, I, I think just be careful of it. Some of the most gifted leaders I work with are the most insecure people. And I, and I don't know if, if they're, if their gifts, if, if their insecurity drove them to, uh, to develop their gifts or if they were just naturally gifted and they got so used to that applause that when they don't have it, uh, they're, they're just insecurity. So I think you just have to be cognizant of the applause of men. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're a, if you're like a freak of an athlete, you didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> you just got good genes. 
You know, it's like, yeah. so I, that's, uh, that's a little bit of the challenge. It's like receiving a, a package from Amazon. You had as much to do with, you know, putting that thing together <laughs> as I, as I, as a lot of these kids with sports, yeah. um, you just signed for it. <laughs> um, so. so what are some of your research uh, about like the warning signs of, of a strain? And I, I use the word strain because it can cover a multitude of things. Strain mentally, strain emotionally, uh, mental health, physical strain. Uh, we don't want to have unhealthy kids. Um, what a, what's a parent looking for to avoid that? That, you know, maybe their kid is, is toasty and, and possibly, you know, under strain with sports. There's two emotions that really drive things. And one is love and one is fear. And fear, fear is a driver and, and will produce things, but it's always going to contract. And so if your kid is fighting, you know, fleeing or freezing on the court, then you know that they are driven by some state of fear. And that goes back to my identity is coming from my performance. And so they're going to fight you to go to practice. They're, they're going to fight a coach. They're, they're just going to fight. And so that's the identifier that goes, okay, fear is driving this. And as a parent, I perfect love cast out all fear. And we know that comes from God, but as a parent, man, I had, Love is a motivator too, and it expands. And so I, uh, if, if they're loving it, they're going to find joy. And if they're finding joy, they'll be an asset to a team. And so I think simplify it and just look, is there fear right now? And the markers are fight, flight, or freeze. And you can see that, or are they being driven by love and yeah. there's joy and peace? and confidence in that route. And I think if we don't listen to the indicators, so if we don't yeah. listen to the indicators, you can have emotional damage, mental damage. Even with the physical indicators, I have a friend of mine who played uh, college field hockey. And not, not you know, not D1 kind of, th I don't, I'm sure there's D1 field hockey, but you know, there's Olympic field mm -hmm. hockey, um, but was an exceptional athlete. But um, she, for the last 20 years, has dealt with excruciating physical damage from playing field hockey. I'm not saying field hockey is a bad thing, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah. But she didn't listen. She didn't listen to her body. She probably should have quit a lot sooner. And now the rest of her life, she has the, when she bends down to pick up her child, she has, uh, she has that damage that she didn't listen to her body in her teens. So just interesting. Yeah, and that's a huge, I mean, right now that's, um, you know, I've got a friend that he is the, He's the guru in sports science and uh, has been involved in the NFL, e everything. And that's one of the things that he talks about. His boys will never play football wow. because of the head injuries. And, you know, and I think that's the thing that you have to realize is that there's a cost associated with this. And if you want to, you know, and so you have to make that decision and, and, um, you have to know your why. I think for the sake of time, I, I want to kind of wrap by by asking you, Brian, could, could you tell us what you would recommend for two sets of parents? And let's kind of end with this is, you know, you got parents that are Joanna's age and, and, you know, their kiddos are just starting out. And you got parents that are, you know, my age where it's like my kiddos are a little bit already in motion and they're already in the thick of it. Um, what advice would you give to parents that are listening that, that they're saying like, Hey, sports are part of the equation. What, what, what would you tell them? Like what, at both of these stages, what would you tell parents to how they can help, help their kids reach their full potential, but do it in a holistically healthy way? I think first off that, uh, be reminded that they're kids, they're kids, you know, their brains aren't connected. Their fibers, especially for a guy, aren't until 25 or 26. A girl's younger, but they're kids. They're kids. And so you're the adult. So one, and, and this is a game. Uh, don't forget that. Uh, 
You know, one of the things, I don't know if you've ever, uh, Billie Jean King has a plaque at the U.S. Open that says pressure is a privilege. Um, teach your kids to, they determine the weight of the pressure they feel. Um, the pressure of expectation, the pressure to get it right, the pressure not to get it wrong, the pressure of time, the pressure to stand out, those are all a privilege. You know, there's a pressure of deprivation that is, I have the pressure that I can't find enough to eat, the pressure of finding shelter, the pressure of avoiding abuse, repression, staying safe. Now, the majority of the world lives in that state of pressure. You're playing a game. Wow. You, you, man, have fun. You're getting to play a game. You know, you're not out looking for a meal when you haven't eaten in, in a week. You're not out. You're not having to be fast because a bullet's coming at you. You know, I, I think that's the thing that we lose sight of what this is really about. Uh, sports are not life or death. This is you're not. That's such good. That's such good perspective. And and I, I think, you know, your statement at the very beginning when you said, like, hey, uh, check yourself, mm -hmm. like check yourself, you know, before before you before you even enter in, you know, you said it. And I think there was so much wisdom in it. Why? Asking that repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Why? What's the why? What's the why? And why am yeah, I frustrated? Don't set your, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think the one thing, too, is um, you can spend a lot of time developing gifts. But if your gifts are greater than your character, you're an implosion waiting to happen. And if you're really, really gifted and you don't have the character, you're going to go to a high level and then you're going to take out, there's going to be carnage around you when you fall. Yeah. And we spend too much time developing gifts and very little time developing character in our culture. And that was, a, there were times that we had to, we literally would put the boys rackets up and say, no, you're not playing because I don't like your character right now. Wow. Um, and because we, we were playing the long game. We were playing long ball. Yeah. Uh, we knew that this was just a step to get them to be the, the person we wanted them to be. It wasn't a step to win a championship. It wasn't a step to win a scholarship. It was a step they had to take to be the best version of themselves that they could be. That's great. Brian, I did ask you to prepare a, uh, a story. Did do you have a one story of someone that got did it, did it right? Some some parent that you know you really saw like an exceptional athlete that parents had the right perspective. Uh, there's there's a kid named Dustin Hopkins. He was came to Florida State. He was in my church. Uh, you know, I, I remember Dustin missing a, a a field goal at Clemson, and when reporters asked him, immediately he turned to his faith. He's been on teams, he's been cut, he's been traded, but he's been on the Browns and he's fought through injuries and he was actually, he was voted into the Pro Bowl and he helped the Browns. But his his mom and dad did such a good job of pouring into him. I, I think Dwayne Holquist, who's a tennis coach at Florida State, Dwayne has five kids, four of those girls all played uh, Division I athletics but they're all young, godly women. They're going to be a blessing in any role they step into. Dwayne and Angela have done a great job with, uh, with those, those girls. They've got a boy on the way that he's still in high school. He, he'll be an outstanding athlete. There's a lot of people that you and I probably have never even heard of that are blessings in their community because their parents built a strong foundation. They use sports to prepare them for life. And they are in obscurity, serving in the shadows, but they're just blessing other people and, uh, and they're great godly people. That's awesome. I'm so glad you shared those because uh, once again, it reminds me that long after the cheers, long after the applause ends, character remains. And that if your career is two years or three years or five years, that character is 50, 80, 
a hundred years. So, wow, that's that's good stuff, Brian. You're a friend. You're a friend of LCBC. You're a friend of mine. I'm thankful that that you were able to come out here and be with us here today and, and share some of this wisdom. You're a big sports fan. We love sports, but we love Jesus more, and uh, we just want to make sure that our kids have what's number one always the number one in their life and you know sports are just a part of it they're not their life and you've given us such incredible wisdom here today brian so i can't thank you enough thanks for coming on the live change podcast and uh we we just appreciate it and we hope to see you again real soon it's been my pleasure as always thanks for listening to the live change podcast like share subscribe and share this episode with someone who you think it would impact as always now that you're a life changed by christ go live that change out